warm welcome to Democratic Socialism in Global Perspective, an international conference organized by the Transnational Institute and the UW Madison Havens Wright Center for Social Justice. My name is Deepa Kumar. Um, I will be moderating the session. I am a professor of media studies at Rutgers University. I've been an activist and a socialist for several decades. And over the last decade, I've been in the leadership of our faculty union, the Rutgers AAUP AFT, which adopted a rank and file and social justice orientation that brings together class demands with race and gender demands. I'd like to thank our translators, uh, Lala, Isabel, and Liz for making it possible for more people to participate in this conference. Right, so the first session of the conference is titled Constructing a New Politics for the 21st Century. I am very excited that this panel includes a really brilliant group of people who have come together and I will introduce each speaker in more detail before they speak. But for now, I just want to mention who they are and welcome them to this discussion. The panelists are Brian Ashley from the Alternative Information and Development Center. Unfortunately, Brian Ashley is unwell today and will not be able to join us. Um, but he was doing a paper along with Daniel Chavez of the Transnational Institute, and Daniel will present that paper. Um, our uh, other speakers include Gar Alperovitz, uh, the Democracy Collective and Joel Rogers associated with the Havens Rights Center. Now, before I give a fuller introduction, I'd like to go over briefly the format um, of this conversation. Each panelist will be given 20 minutes. And after that, we will have 60 minutes for discussion, Q&A, comments, and the like. Um, you can share your questions throughout the session using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. I also have a request for conference presenters. If you could please think of comments or questions that you may have to our panelists as they're speaking and then come in once they are done, that would be really fantastic. The idea of course is to engage one another and make this conference a truly collaborative learning uh, process. So with that, I would like to introduce our first speakers. Um, Daniel Chavez is a Dutch Uruguayan activist scholar. He has been a TNI fellow since 2005 and has published extensive research on emancipatory politics and public policies, including co-editing several books such as The New Latin American Left, Utopia Reborn, Rethinking the Public, State, Society and Basic Services in Latin America, and Public Water and COVID-19, Dark Clouds and Silver Linings. The title of Brian and Danielle's presentation is New Politics for a Post-COVID World. Danielle. Thank you very much. I'm gonna be uh, sharing a presentation. So yeah, there you can see it. As Deepa say, Brian is not feeling so well today but he's gonna be joining us for the rest of the conference. So I will try to cover both parts, uh, Brian's part and my part. There are gonna be three joint presentations this week. And we had uh, authorized as organizer to give a little more time for these joint presentations. So I had planned, we had planned with Brian something like 30 minutes. I will try to keep it if possible shorter uh, than that. Um, what I will, what uh, I will do, or we will do, because this was prepared together with Brian, is to outline some key questions and challenges that progressive socialists and activists around the world are facing today. As the opening presentation, we will address many issues that most likely will be discussed in more detail by other panels in this uh, same uh, conference. The idea was that. I was going to provide a very quick and general overview of the contents of our paper. And then Brian would use the second half of our slot to discuss some key issues more in detail. For instance, the question of the state. But I will try to cover uh, both uh, parts. 
So uh, before we go on, I want to clarify that the presentation is going to be structured in three parts. The first part refers to a general analysis of the economic, political, and social context of what we call a new politics. Let's begin with unpacking the meaning and scope of the current crisis, which implies considering the situation before the virus struck, before the pandemic uh, began. And in order to understand the current crisis and what happens in, during, and after systemic crisis, we find this quote by Ben Phillips, a South African uh, thinker, a South African researcher, quite uh, helpful. He argues that even rich and social, uh, even rich and social, social and, and political structure can be uh, reshaped. But he also says that how they bend depends on the heat and the direction in which they are pressed harder. So we will try to elaborate around this idea in what follows in our presentation. And first of all, we need to take into account that the pandemic is not really a new crisis, and it's actually the second global crisis in less than a decade. The previous crisis began in 2007, but it actually never ended. So many of the problems we see today in the context of the pandemic, in particular the social and economic dimension of the pandemic, has to do with problems that were unresolved after the crisis that began in 2007 and 2008. In fact, when the pandemic struck, many countries, both in the South and in the North, had not yet recovered from the global financial, economic, and social crisis of previous uh, year. And around the globe, in the years before the pandemic, there were already massive social discontent against the economic and political elites. After government had favored bailing out the banks, the insurance company, and transnational corporations instead of prioritizing the needs of the people. This is a picture from the US, but we could see similar uh, demos all around the world, both in the north and in the south. In the region where I live and where I work, and where I am mainly an activist in, the, in, in Europe, and in particular in the European periphery, many countries have been forced to implement very radical austerity programs designed to cut social policies and privatize public, public services to repay the debts. This is a picture from Greece, and I guess you can uh, recognize the, the flags uh, and the banners. And the so-called Troika, the Holy Alliance composed by the European Commission, the European Central Bank, and the International Monetary Fund, had been put in charge of economic policy, not only of Greece, but also of Portugal and Spain, displacing the authority of the national government that had been voted by the people. And not only in Europe, and not only in the European periphery, but around the world, there was an increasing feeling of distrust in, econo in economics and political institutions. This new way of discontent and uprising spread around the world. I guess you will all remember the demonstration of that time. We could talk about Occupy Wall Street in 2011, the Spanish indignado in Spain uh, in the same year, what happened in Brazil, what happened in Turkey, and many massive social mobilization in some cases, social uprisings, actually, against neoliberalism in different regions of the world. And many of these uh, social uprisings of the previous decade also included uh, demands for radical democratic reforms aimed at getting rid of authoritarian regimes. Many of us had a lot of hope in the outcome, outcomes of the so-called Arab Springs of 2010 and 2011, which sadly for the people of the region did not materialize and ended up in a long and gloomy Arab uh, winter, actually. Let's now briefly review the economic and social impacts of the uh, pandemic. Uh, these are some figures that we got from a report that was published at the end of uh, last year by one uh, UN agency, the 
United Nations a Conference on Trade and Development, which is possibly the most progressive agency of the uh, UN system. And they publish a report that try to quantify the impacts of the pandemic. And the figures that they refer are already some weeks and months after they were published quite outdated. For instance, they refer to 1 million deaths due to the pandemic. Now we know that the confirmed death had been a uh, many more. A contraction in GDP, they refer to glo a global figure, but in some countries in the South, the contraction has been much, much uh, worse. And also a huge number, more than 130 uh, million people that now live in extreme poverty in relation or because of the aggravation of problems that were caused by the pandemic or during the uh, pandemic. This is the cover of the reports uh, we refer to. And indeed, millions of jobs have been already uh, lost. M millions of livelihoods are at extreme risk in different countries of the, the uh, world. And the idea was that Brian could give you a more direct perspective from South Africa, which is one of the countries where you can see every day the worst manifestations of this uh, crisis. In summary, uh, the crisis was not caused by the pandemic, but COVID-19 made much worse a series of trends that were already converging into what the uh, UNTA uh, report referred to as a perfect uh, storm. Moving further, let's now review some current trends that seem to be emerging in rather curious uh, places. First of all, we see that some of our friends and, uh, and allies in the unions and in the NGO, uh, progressive NGO, are convinced that the likelihood of a return to the so-called old normal is quite unlikely. And also that the crisis offered us a unique chance to rewrite the economic rules once and uh, for all. And what we see is that even the mainstream media seems to share that uh, opinion. In March, the British newspaper, The Guardian, published a special report in which they argued that COVID-19 had brought back the state and that the economic devastation had turned decades worth of economic orthodoxy in their, on their uh, head. The reference to the state or what the Guardian calls here in the cover uh, big uh, government is quite important. Uh, the idea was that uh, Brian would further discuss the meaning and the role of the state in the second part of our presentation, but maybe this is something that we can leave for the uh, question and answer time after the uh, presentation. But we also see that even the mainstream media, and in particular the media that for many decades had defended the more radical form of free market economies, seem to agree with at least part of this uh, perspective. In July last year, the economists openly stated that the old economic paradigm they had defended for so long was no longer working and that there is a need and an opportunity to rethink economics whatever they really mean uh, with that, uh, we would say. The problem is that uh, we had or already heard similar sound bites some years ago, including some of our friends and comrades who had argued that neoliberalism uh, was dead. Anyway, uh, beyond academic or political debates about the supposed uh, death of uh, neoliberalism, we see that capitalism is very much alive and most probably will continue like that for many years to come. But neoliberalism seems to be in crisis indeed. The main difference between the crisis of 2007 and 2008 and the current crisis is that when the financial crisis, crisis erupted, the measures taken were very weak and that the priority was to bail out uh, capital. Now, in 2020, uh, we saw more or, or stronger uh, governmental actions, including a higher degree of disregard for market uh, solutions. 
Unfortunately, the alternative to neoliberalism and market-driven economics and polities will not necessarily be progressive or democratic. We all know uh, Danny Roderick. We can call him a sort of progressive economist, but he's by no means a leftist or a socialist. But uh, what he says uh, deserves uh, to be uh, discussed because he can be uh, partly true, uh, truthful when he argues that no one should expect the pandemic to alter, much less reverse, tendencies that were evident before the crisis. According to Roderick, neoliberalism will continue its slow death, populist, populist autocrats will become even more authoritarian, and the left will continue to struggle to devise a program that appeals to a majority of voters. Obviously, the resolution of the debate around the supposed uh, death of uh, neoliberalism or the future of neoliberalism and free market economics will depend on the evolution of economic indicators in the aftermath of the economy. Today, we see some cautious optimism as vaccination starts to be rolled out in many countries but there's plenty of uncertainty about the real health of the global economy. Are we looking at a V-shaped uh, recovery in the next period, or are we in an extended period of secular stagnation? Uh, we could have an interesting discussion about these uh, two covers of the economies, but uh, maybe we can leave that for the question and comments uh, answer. Um, besides that, our understanding is that we should not expect a spontaneous exit from neoliberalism. And it's quite likely that once the crisis uh, abates, there will be a return to austerity and generalized enabling of big corporate uh, power, uh, big tech, and globalized uh, capitalism. This is particularly so because of the power of finance capital. Um, we see no break with the further financialization of the global economy and the rise of big tech corporations that dominate the key sector of information uh, technology. But first, let's have a very quick look at the root of the crisis. Uh, yeah, and we're not going to go here in detail because there's going to be another panel on economics, and I'm sure they will address some of these uh, issues. First, we need to be aware that many economies are saying that the global situation of the uh, economic indicator is much worse today than were before the crisis erupted in 2007 and uh, 2008. For instance, we all know what uh, uh, Walden and many other economies have been writing uh, about that. This has to do, on the one hand, to the reconfiguration of global supply chains, which have negatively affected domestic, industrial, and agricultural production all over the world, but in particular in countries of the South. This disruption of global supply chains was very clear in the context of the pandemics for the reasons we all uh, know. Another reason became quite clear in 2008, when the global financial crisis hit and borrowing was no longer an option for many highly indebted uh, households. The third reason had also become obvious already many years ago. This is a cover of the economies of 2014, which shows that speculation has been at the core of many global crises several times uh, before. This means that industrial production declines or becomes stagnant, Investors pay more attention to finances, where greater profits can be made from speculation. Let's go very quickly now to the second uh, part of our presentation, focus on alternatives to neoliberalism and authoritarianism. We added authoritarianism to this section because, as we know, not only progressive or democratic forces are currently interested in dismantling the hegemonic economic system. First, we need to recognize that we continue to organize in a period of great skepticism to socialism and the ident identification of socialist idea with 
Stalinism or authoritarianism in parallel to the weakening of international solidarity. This is a picture from a demo in Poland, but we could find very similar picture from many countries around the world. We also see that global capitalism placed the working classes of each country in competition with each other in the context of the ratio of the bottom with respect to wages, social conditions, health, and environmental conditions. If we consider the strength, militancy, and consciousness of the so-called proletariat in the major industrialized economies, including China, we see very low levels of organization, high levels of repression, high levels of co-option and bureaucratization, and a general failure to organize the really existing working class, often referred to as the precariat. And also, if we consider the, the, this situation, uh, we also see that this is a problem that doesn't only affect the economies and societies of the South, because the problem of the precariat, uh, the lack of uh, safe, uh, permanent, secure, uh, dignified jobs is also a problem in the uh, global North. Of course, there are counter tendencies, and uh, we can quote quite many, where we see new struggles and movements arising. For, a, for instance, we could talk about the Black Lives Matter movement in the UK, and there are going to be some presentation in this conference uh, focused uh, on that. We could also see very interesting mobilization for legal, safe, and free abortion, abortion and women's rights in Poland and Argentina, for instance, or the big strike movement of small scale farmers in India. But uh, the question that we are addressing in, in our paper, the one that will come out after the conference for the, for the book, is what is the general trend of all these this different uh, mobilizations. And of course, we all agree with uh, Walden Bello and other thinkers when they argue that we need articulation of progressive alternatives that uh, take into account at the same time the problems of inequality and even development, uh, climate, etc. The problem is how to integrate all that. And that leads us to the final part of our presentation that has to do with the left and the crisis vis-a-vis -vis the uh, rise of the uh, rise. And this is important because in our paper we argue that the left has a tendency to see crisis as doing its work uh, for it. For instance, the left expects that the crisis will radicalize the masses and forces them to take militant action. But we know from previous crises that this is not always uh, the case. And this is uh, also true in relation to the sudden conversion of many leftists and Marxists to the environmentalism and climate justice movement as the impossibility of solvi solving the climate crisis on the basis of capitalism gives hope, including to all of us, I guess, of a mass conversion of people to anti-capitalist politics. But uh, as Brian was planning to elaborate on the second part of, the, of this presentation, this convergence between the left and environmental movements, a red-green alliance, in many cases around the world are quite problematic. But we're going to have a panel on Friday that will talk uh, about that. So I'm getting quite close to the end of our presentation. Some of our friends and comrades, such as uh, Jerome Ross, as well as Hilary Wainwright in the paper that she will present for, for this conference, have highlighted the need for a sort of disaster socialism to confront the uh, crisis. And this refers to what's the role for the state in the context of alternative to the current crisis. And I'm not going to go in detail into that because we're going to have a special panel about uh, the role of the state, but this is a key question that we also address in uh, our paper. But we must be aware that the left operates within complex and rapidly changing political frameworks with several possible scenarios ahead. 
Therefore, to address the meaning of left alternatives and democratic socialism today, we must, we must be brutally honest and sober in assessing the state of the class struggle in diverse locations around the world. Uh, and the first scenario we could imagine is the consolidation of the far right and a shift toward more, even more authoritarian policies and politics than the one we see being applied today in many countries around the world. This is because the far right has proven to be very smart and opportunistic in taking advantage of social uh, discontent. In many places around the world, we have seen this uh, tendency with the rise of authoritarian uh, government. All these governments are quite different in the kind of policies uh, they apply, but they seem to share a similar set of values and disregard for the basic rules of liberal democracy. For instance, we could talk about uh, Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil, about Viktor Orban in Hungary, about Rodrigo Duterte in Filipinas, about the law and justice party in Poland. But unfortunately, these are just a few examples because there are many similar experiences that have emerged in recent years in different regions of the uh, world. And in too many countries around the world, we see the rise of right-wing fascist and authoritarian ideas and movement where these ideas have uh, taken hold. Uh, racism, xenophobia, misogyny have overwhelmed a good percentage of the populations around the world in the vacuum left by, by mass socialist, communist, social democratic and progressive movement for national liberation. In many countries, uh, including in the region where uh, I live in Europe, much of the voting of the far right comes from people that until not some not so long ago, used to vote for communist or socialist uh, party. The second scenario, I'm not going to go in detail into that because we don't think this is uh, viable. This has to do with the revival of social democracy and neo Keynesian economics. This is the kind of politics and policies, for instance, defended by many people today organized around the progressive international. Not all of them, but many prominent names uh, related to that. But as some other researchers had uh, already argued, the revival of the welfare state, the export of the welfare state, the, the return to social democracy is not really an option for most countries of the uh, South. The third scenario, which is the one we would all prefer, centered around the resurgence of the left, aware of the shortcomings and mistakes of the progressive governments of the 1990s and the last uh, decade, is the one I guess uh, we would all uh, uh, support. So we're looking forward to the presentation by our Latin American and Greek friends to hear about what uh, they will say about uh, uh, this uh, trend. And I'm just about to, to finalize. What we feel is that this implies addressing many difficult and comfortable and uncomfortable questions uh, for the less. For instance, how do we build power from below? We see that the left has won many elections in recent years, including in very important countries, but to a large extent has not been able to use parliamentary power to push through what we call structural or non-reformist uh, reform, as we saw during the governments of the PT in Brazil and in other countries of Latin America. For instance, uh, we want to uh, analyze more in detail in our chapter, what is the balance sheet of the left in government in countries such as Brazil, Bolivia, Ecuador, Uruguay, and Greece. But there are gonna be other presentations about this in this uh, conference. But we also need to explain the experiences of top left, walk right kind of uh, government. As we see today with the government of the Ortega Murillo family in Nicaragua, or the government of Nicolás Maduro in Venezuela, with a clear shift towards right wing and authoritarian policies, where it has become almost impossible to talk about this government as a left government. We Daniel, also sorry to this, interrupt you. Yeah, but yeah, I'm finalizing. I'm finalizing. 
Also, what is the real emancipatory potential of the participation of UNIDAS Podemos in the current government of Spain? Uh, we will hear from Juan Carlos Monederos uh, uh, in this uh, conference. So uh, to finalize, we must be aware that the left operate within very complex and rapidly changing political framework with several possible scenarios uh, uh, ahead. Uh, to finalize uh, what we argue in the paper, is that uh, we need to abandon the hierarchy of uh, struggles that was so dear uh, for the left uh, until recently. This is especially true in the context of the pandemic where we have seen how COVID-19 unequally affects black people or people of color and also how it has made more visible the role of women in the care economy. We also uh, need to see how the left prepared to operate in a New, no norm, new, uh, new normal where mobilization is going to be uh, uh, quite difficult and the previous kind of organization will be almost impossible. And also how to connect uh, our left struggles with the urgent need to uh, respond to the climate emergency. But as I said, there's going to be a panel on Friday. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. That was a really comprehensive but also dazzling presentation with all the graphics. So thank you very much for setting that tone for this conference. So we're now moving to a different region of the world and we turn to Gar Alperovitz. Gar is the co-founder of the Democracy Collaborative and co-chair of the Next Systems Project, a historian, political economist, activist, writer, and government official he was the Lionel R. Bauman Professor of Political Economy at the University of Maryland and is a former fellow of King's College, Cambridge University. He was also at Harvard's Institute of Politics, the Institute for Policy Studies, and a guest scholar at the Brookings Institution. He's also the president of the National Center for Economic and Security Alternatives. The title of his presentation is A Pluralist Commonwealth and a Community Sustaining System. Uh, thank you. And uh, first, just a remembrance of Leo and Eric. It's very appropriate that this conference remember them and the great work they've done. Uh, I'm glad that was opened up at the beginning. Um, I'm going to speak primarily about our assessment at the Democracy Collaborative of what's going on in the United States in our judgment and some of the implications that may be important for other advanced and non and other systems. Um, the, the first kind of major kind of judgment that needs to be made is that for the most part, social democratic politics around the world and progressive politics in general has largely and significantly depended upon an organized labor movement. Uh, in Sweden, it reached 85% of the labor force, for instance, in the most advanced welfare states and social democratic politics was organized on that basis. Labor unions in the United States have been almost extinguished as a basis either for labor struggle or as the institutional foundations of a different politics, by which I mean private sector labor union membership is 6% of the labor force now. Overall, nationally, it's about 11%, which includes public sector teachers and government, government uh, administrators. So we have lost, and compare Sweden at 1.85%. So the basis of the traditional social democratic response to capitalism, at least in the United States, and plausibly in other countries as the trends of decay continue, uh, in, for instance, Britain, elsewhere in parts of Scandinavia, the trends are weakening all along, is the loss of the institutional capacity for that model, which opens up obvious dangers of the kind we've seen with the Trump administration, uh, the dangers of the radical right. Many, many things can be said about the dangers of a transitional period, but what it as asks of the left is, how does one think about the transformation in our judgment of a political economic system that loses its institutional base in labor? What is the foundational set of institutions that might be built as labor unions were once built over a 30, 40 year trajectory to give content and foundational po power to a different politics, 
but also a different model of political economic systems. So that's one way to enter this discussion. There are other ways to enter some of the differences in the United States from other countries. Uh, the scale is obviously very, very important to deal with, and I'm going to speak to that a little bit later. Uh, France can be easily dropped into Texas. Germany is smaller than the state of Montana. California is the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world. So we face special problems because of scale, and I'll return to that question. But the underlying issue I want to point, kind of stress, is what happens when you lose the when you lose the labor movement and the slow decay of the labor movement in many parts of the world as well under attack and under the impact of technology and, and the different politics. One of the things we have been doing at the Democracy Collaborative and also in experiments in many parts of, in different parts of the country here, particularly many know the Cleveland work we've done and work in Preston, England we've done elsewhere, is the reconstruction of institutional foundations in the con in the concept and paradigm of local geographic communities, the most important ones being in, in Cleveland, where there's an advanced system of six or 700 workers now in community slash worker owned institutions, working from the ground up as ownership and control of parts of the capital of capital on the ground. And similarly, in a different way in Preston, England, but beginning with the paradigm of community as a reconstructive long term basis institutionally for transformative politics, which is political and what is its formation and its agenda is both political and institutional. And I wanna say just a bit about that. That's a, a uh, radical reshaping that at one point was in, involved in some forms of anarchist thought, but the notion of the idea of rebuilding community is extremely inclusive. It is not simply labor and it's not simply by race, and also by gender, it brings, and by age, it brings in all the people within a geographic circle as part of the political basis of the next transformation as a matter of principle. And we've seen some development of that kind taking on interesting and important economic forms. Uh, many of you know some of the work that's done in Cleveland, where we now have uh, six or 700 people in community slash worker owned companies. There were experiments in Youngstown in the earlier 20 years ago that began setting up a different paradigm. Preston in England has a different community-wide inclusive paradigm as the foundation, not just of economic reconstruction, as the labor movement begins and continues its decline in power, but also as the institutional base of politics. So that's an interesting and, and different way of thinking about it. It may or may not apply to different countries other than the ones we've been experimenting with and what we've been thinking about, particularly in the United States and Britain, but elsewhere, the rebuilding over time, and it took this long to build the labor movement, institutional foundations of a modest progressive politics or a social democratic politics, or sometimes a democratic socialist politics, the building of community institutions as a critical building block for that transformation. I could go on to describe some of the things in, 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 in the United States in many, many parts of the country that are building in this direction. It includes transforming banking institutions to community or state institutions, socializing them in, at local level first as the precondition of a politics and an empowerment to the national level or to the regional level, but building land ownership, land, land basis, socializing land, either in land trusts or community owned land or neighborhood owned land, slowly rebuilding the fundaments in everyday life, in practice of some of the elements of a public and, co and communal and social, socially owned system in all parts, not just the working parts, but land, education, health, and all the bits and pieces of public utilities, television, from the ground up as a matter, not only of local experience of a different system as pragmatic and practical, but also as the basis of building a new organizing power and a new organizing base as labor unions continue their decline as the power base of a social democratic politics. Now that's an unusual and radical kind of way of thinking about it. And it is one we have to face, I think, and we would argue in the United States, since the labor component of the traditional social democratic 
or socialist base is now down to 6% of the labor force in the private sector, 11% if you include public sector teachers and government, government administrators, and declining. So I pose this question for, for discussion. How do you build a next system, a democratic socialist system, in the absence of the traditional organized labor union base? Let us face that question and without ducking it. And we think there is a way to do that. It takes the same length of time that it took to build the labor movement. It takes laying the groundwork, but also advancing simultaneously a politics and a political program for systemic change. So I am not in any way urging a re retreat from systemic issues. And there are going to be opportunities. The United States went through the crisis, the Great, the great Recession crisis, and it nationalized de facto General Motors, Chrysler Corporation, several of the big banks, and the fin financial system as a whole was under public quasi ownership or control. We are weakening the restraints around the financial system in many parts of the, of the political system. And we can expect further crises as time goes on that raise these large order questions, even as a base built from the bottom up can begin to mature over time. I sometimes speaking about this with students is this game requires, if you wanna play this game, the, the, the chips, the things you must throw on the table are at least 10, 20, 30 years of hard work. Those are the things that are required to build up the politics and a new vision and a new understanding of what might happen both from the bottom up, but as we get recurrent crises from the top down. Two other things that need to be said, particularly about the United States, which do or do not apply to some other countries, but they're particularly relevant here. One is the problem of scale. The continental scale system of the United States runs 3,000 miles diagonally from the Northeast to the Southwest. That is a gigantic continental system. And the question needs to be posed and is being posed here, ultimately, how do you have participatory democracy in a system 3000 miles in scope? That's the system in which the corporations play, each other, play off labor and different communities one after another, because they have the capacity to move around that continental system, just as they do on the imperial system. So ultimately the question is posed, regional decentralization is probably the only ultimate answer to that challenge. That is the region of California, the fifth or sixth largest economy becomes increasingly in a larger vision of where we go for a democratic socialist future, a more and more autonomous democratically owned economy. That the same thing happens when you look at New England or the upper Northwest, but the issue of scale cannot be ducked. And I think that at least in the United States, some other countries, I think, have to face that. Some do not and are able to think about it without having that challenge. The other one is the great racial divisions, black, Hispanic, and white, and how somehow those three find at least some common ground in this country, even as the other side uses the wedges to try to divide and conquer. That is another special question that needs to be brought together. And we think the paradigm of rebuilding communities gives common interests that can be built up as time goes on. And again, in the context of a radically declining and, de and almost destructed, destroyed labor movement, which most people do not, at least in the judgment and studies we've been seeing, do not think can be rebuilt in the form of the old social democratic model. On the other hand, community building interests from the bottom up can become regions of alliance where each has similar alliances. I happen to work with steel workers in, in Ohio, in the Youngstown communities, white working class steel workers, building a notion of worker takeover, worker takeover of the large steel mills, which was not difficult for them, even though they did not come with a socialist consciousness. They saw that as a way to save their jobs and build a politics. That possibility of pragmatic vision of what can be done, even amongst people in many parts of the country, the United States are seen as not as uh, the people who fueled the Trump's ba background. No, not so, very open to different politics in many parts of the country if progressives and left begin to move in that direction. So I, I wanna raise those larger possibilities of what we've become going to call evolutionary reconstruction as the foundational basis of political change. 
What does that mean? That means building simultaneously from the ground up new institutional bases that represent both power and the beginning paradigms of a community-based vision of the larger system, even as the decay goes forward. Secondly, alliances of communities, black, white, and, and uh, Hispanic in the United States. And thirdly, a question that really comes up here uh, in a way in a continental system, how does one begin to think about radical decentralization of a continental system 3,000 miles from diagonally top to bottom, which means ultimately regional decentralization? All of that is long-term strategy and development, something like what happened with the development of social democracy, the possibilities of decade by decade building from the bottom up, understanding that the goal is to reach for systemic change at all levels, and secondly, as the retreat of empire continues to take place because of the outside pressure from groups around the world of challenging the imperial structures. So in, we do not expect utopia. We also expect violence, continued violence, the rise of people like Mr. Trump and his allies. There is likely to be a very difficult and challenging period. The question is, how can we begin to shape not only a politics, but an actually developed systemic vision that takes us beyond the traditional models of social democracy on the one hand, state socialism on the other, and the beginning emergence of a models that, take, that are inclusive of communities of all kinds, but also build power from the bottom up by community structuring. So that's a larger vision of what we've been doing at the Democracy Collaborative, trying to do that. And we're finding uh, very practical and pragmatic opportunities around the country where people see this in communities as something that is open to their, their own organizing capacities, that open up ways that seem practical to them to start in local ways to build, and then also begin thinking about what that could do for a national politics. Um, a friend of mine often says, if you wanna play this game, the chips of it, chips that you must throw on the table are decades of your life. It is a long reconstructive process with a politics and an institutional reconstruction simultaneously, but the transformation is towards a democratic socialist system built around community restructuring up and up and beyond, even as in our country, at least, the organized labor movement, which was hardly ever a very serious democratic socialist in the modern era, declines to less than 6% of the labor force in the private sector. So I think I'll leave it at that as a way to open the discussion of what we call evolutionary reconstruction towards a pluralist vision of a commonwealth beyond. Thank you so much, Gar. Um, we're now going to move to Joel Rogers, who will be serving as a discussion for this uh, section. Uh, Joel is the Noam Chomsky Professor of Law, Political Science, Public Affairs, and Sociology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he also directs the Havens Wright Center for Social Justice. He's written widely on party politics, democratic theory, as well as cities and urban regions. He has initiated and helped lead several progressive NGOs, including the New Party, now the Working Families Party, EARN, WRTP, the Apollo Alliance, now part of the Blue Green Alliance, Emerald Cities Collaborative, State Innovation Exchange, and Epic N, Educational Partnership for Innovation in Communities Network. So Joel will uh, finish this panel and then I'll throw it open to Q&A and discussion. There was also a question about whether these sessions are going to be recorded. Indeed they are and they will be posted. So do look out for that. Uh, okay, uh, thank you Deepa. And thanks for the organizers of this conference which the Havens Wright Center is one. I run the Havens Wright Center or I'm the director uh, and uh, Patrick and, uh, and um, Pete and, and others who started us out. Thanks very much for, for calling out uh, Leo and, and Eric. They're both friends, Eric particularly, but, but Leo as well. So I really like the way that you started. And, and in my comments, I wanna keep them as brief as, as I can um, on, on what Daniel presented and what Gar presented. Um, I certainly agree with Daniel's questions and, and I agree very broadly with, with, uh, with Gar's uh, solution. So let me, let me just, by way of comment, 
take Daniel's question of the essential question is I, I took it to be how do you actually build power from the bottom up? You know, what what is the base of it and how can you uh, through the the power that you build there exert yourself somewhere in in national state institutions, given the disappointment, uh, disappointing results thus far with all electoral forms of, or electoral only forms of socialism. Um, uh, and with Gar, uh, yeah, I, I certainly, I, I don't think it's only true of the US. I think in general, uh, you're getting pressure all over the world for uh, fragmentation of national, you're getting a fragmentation of national politics and you're getting an increased regionalization of a lot of uh, conflicts, but also possibilities. But, but let, me, let me say this before saying something about, about those things. Um, uh, for the general audience, and I, I'd invite um, both Daniel and Gar to respond to this, but, but uh, again, I, I wanna keep this relatively short given uh, uh, given an interest in getting into the general discussion. I, I think that in general, however horrible things are right now, and they're very likely to get more horrible, um, considerably more horrible um, before they get much better anytime soon. Uh, I, I do think for this whole discussion, it would be uh, wise for us to think that we have a lot of, uh, of wind at our backs. And it's, that, that is not only because of fantastic popular disgust with the, uh, you know, with the effects of the neoliberalism period. You know, some people date as since Reagan, so that'd be 40 years. Others dated from the early 70s. So that'd be more like, or the Powell Memorandum even. Uh, so that'd be 50 years. But the last 40 to 50 years uh, of neoliberalism, I think, as a view of how you should run an economy and construct a society has been morally bankrupt for a very, very long time and widely recognized as morally bankrupt for a very, very long time, maybe since its first enunciation. But now I think um, we've reached some sort of tipping point um, as it, as, in it, uh, in its in confidence in it as any sort of plausible account of how you should run the world and, and run societies in the world. I think in general, um, uh, the politics of the left should be relating to intelligently in the future is one that, that at the national level is much more focused on, you know, Keynes called it self-sufficiency and less on, uh, on endlessly, uh, um, uh, so certainly not invading other places, but also uh, uh, not relying uh, too much uh, on other places. I, I'm not sit preaching some sort of autarky or socialism in one country type thing here, but you, you want to have enough uh, provided within your, your national political community to sort of keep the thing going. Um, that, that, that sort of very crude understanding of sufficiency. And in international relations, you don't want you don't want really a, a you know a velt a, a veltmach. Uh, you don't want a world uh, you don't want world capitalism. You want something more like regional planning. To allude to another thing from uh, that war period, that was a famous essay by uh, um, by Karl Polanyi. But but in terms of the stuff that's on our side. Um, um, uh, I, I hope people can think of this not only as a, you know, constructing a better society, of course, is, you know, that, that's what we're about for the rest of our lives, but certainly the idea of constructing a serious functioning alternative to the wreckage of the last 50 years is going to take some time. It's going to create, it's going to create or require you know, not the optimism of uh, the will and the pessimism and the intellect, you know, a line which you should not attribute, although it's often attributed to Gramsci, who didn't like the line at all. And it actually originated somewhere else, as Leo pointed out to me uh, a, couple, a few years ago. Uh, Gramsci's view, which I would recommend, is one 
which we don't fall into the banal moods of optimism or pessimism, but be armed with something like unlimited patience and, and confidence in some sort of struggle, some sort of secular faith uh, that if people get together, uh, they can make themselves into anything that they're w uh, uh, willing to be, uh, or if they, people get together, they can make themselves into anything that they're clever and courageous enough to imagine themselves becoming, a sort of a classical, the humanist view of the human prospect. Um, so, all right, but, but on things that are on our side, um, the things that are on our side is technology uh, continues to advance and science continues to advance. We know more about the world, a lot more about the world and our position in the world and how we work and, uh, and how we can work better and how we can be aided more by other things, et cetera. So I'll call all of that technology. Technology continues to advance. It may not be at quite the pace that we'd like it to be advancing. It may not be, um, it's certainly all these things are unequal in their distribution of reward, but, but uh, the things I'm going to describe suggest a, a, a possibility of a story that I don't, I don't think the world has ever had for the actual universalization of, of the democratic left project, which is, which I take to be one in which everyone has broadly equal access to whatever they need to develop their own capacities and in which they're, they're self-governed on, on terms of, of equal respect and equal authority. Um, I think the, the future is brighter for a sort of democratic socialism or a liberal socialism or call it what you were, socialism, socialism, call it what you will. N not the traditional social democracy. I quite agree with everyone who's remarked that is days are largely past, but uh, a truly productive egalitarian democracy, I think, is uh, increasingly plausible. All right, so technology is one thing. Um, the other thing is that the world is much better, and I'm, I'm talking in global terms here, but the world is much better educated now than, uh, than it was 50 years ago. Uh, you've got a huge number of people who, um, uh, can read and write and technology is going to help with their communication with each other. You know, I'm not an internet uh, freak particularly, but the fact that we're going to relatively soon have simultaneous translation is really going to topple uh, this Tower of Babel. We're going to be able to talk to each other, not just uh, send messages to each other in a common language uh, very, very soon. Uh, and, and the fact that we're all doing that off a bigger, a much more widely shared knowledge base than we had uh, 50 years ago, much less 100 years ago, uh, I think is good. The other thing is, uh, you know, despite the, uh, you know, uh, white Christian nation a lot of Americans have about this place or, um, you know, Islamic uh, uh, fundamentalism um, triggering into authoritarianism in other parts of the world or, you know, a variety of other, you know, religious uh, declensions from, uh, from love, which is what we should all be about. I, I, I think in the world, it's unmistakable that you've got growing secularization uh, throughout all the world. So you've got a greater possibilities for redeeming the, the promise, which was you know, always imperfectly offered of, of, of a sort of enlightenment now. Don't worry, I'm not going to do a Steve Pinker on you. I, I'm much more a, a, a Max Roser. You know, the world is much better than it was. Uh, the world is terrible. Uh, the world can be much better. I think that's the view that we should have. But we should not forget the fact the world is on various dimensions much, much better uh, than 50, much less 100 years ago. The other thing is, I think that we understand, uh, um, you know, as we understand this in business systems, I think we understand increasingly in political systems and a variety of community uh, uh, organizing systems, a whole uh, variety of different ways in which people come together to get stuff down. I think we understand better uh, elements of design on the community stuff, sort of user-centered design in the structuring of of, uh, of, of firms, of team-based design and, and getting, getting in various ways 
It's a famous book. I'm blanking on the name of the author. It's says complete. It's I think the book is called Completing Evolution. Uh, we understand how we can relate to each other more productively now than in the past. And, and I think we've made significant progress on that. But the all time thing that's happened, and I think the left has neglected the fantastic possibilities it puts before us is that uh, the world is also urbanizing. I know this is familiar to everyone, but, but I would suggest Daniel and others, everyone here, take seriously the natural spatial bases of the egalitarian politics that we'd all like to have. And that, that's right in front of us. It's in the fact that well more than 50% of the world's population is now living in urban areas. And, uh, and that's gonna go up to, you know, 80, 85% within our next lifetimes, certainly in the next 25, 30 years or so. And, and that suggests a, a point where we can begin to do the politics that, that Gar is talking about uh, with a clear base, based in actual people, uh, where you can optimize the production of a wide number of public goods under some level of uh, serious uh, democratic uh, control and make life better for an awful lot of people. Um, you know, 80% of the world population is a pretty good share of the world population. Of course, there's a huge amount of politics that you know, then goes on between what we do in the, in the urban areas. I sometimes use the shorthand cities, but always think urban areas or heavily urbanized areas and their hinterlands. And of course, those relations have often been, usually are quite exploitative by the city of the of the hinterland, but but there's enough wealth that's going to be produced in these in these urban areas, and uh, all the things just talked about permits their fantastically better design than what we've done thus far, and fantastic wealth that can be uh, fantastically better shared. Um, um, that I, I think the left should really pay attention to to that urbanization potential. Uh, a thing that often comes up on the left that I, I'm not as worried about as, uh, as, as some people is the climate crisis. Uh, why am I less worried about it? Well, I, of course I'm worried about it. We, we can't destroy the conditions of the biosphere and not be worried about uh, the climate crisis. But I do think that on the essential elements of that, uh, and here again, the cities are gonna help out enormously we can get back the biodiversity. Nature is pretty, pretty resilient, guys. We can certainly produce a fantastic amount of, uh, of clean energy to fuel the world. We can get up to the, you know, roughly 50 terawatts provided on a consistent basis for a world population expected to be about 10 billion and to basically level out there uh, pretty easily um, through existing uh, and, uh, um, not yet implemented uh, technologies. So if energy is okay, clean energy is okay, uh, and uh, the rest of the environment uh, can be preserved and, and restored and, and subject to more efficient and, and more loving use. And the cities are these, uh, you know, wonderful sites of uh, uh, more communal public goods and and a variety of forms of re reorganization of property along the lines that the GAR and other people have suggested. Um, the, the prospect is pretty bright. It's not quite, you know, so bright that you got to wear shades. But but I want I want people to be uh, sort of upbeat. Uh, this is going to be a terribly hard fight, uh, and I don't want to suggest that it's any way guaranteed at all. Uh, but this current system is at a certain low point in terms of its credibility. And I do think we have the fundamental material elements uh, to build something better. So let me end it there and uh, uh, let's get into the discussion in the back and forth. Thank you so much, Joel. And thank you to all the presenters for such a fantastic start to the conference. So we already have several questions in the Q&A box. I just want to, again, alert people to not use the chat function, but to use the Q&A box so that all the questions can be collected together. But before turning to the questions, I want to give a few minutes to our conference presenters who are all um, on Zoom here with us um, to raise their own questions, their own 
comments. Um, so we'll take that first and then go to the Q&A um, from attendees, from conference attendees. So the way to do that would be to please, um, you know, stop your, don't stop your video, have your video live, raise your hand, or if you prefer, you can put your name um, into the uh, chat box and I can call you that way, then you can unmute and proceed to ask your questions. So conference presenters. Uh, Deepa, maybe you need to clarify who you are referring to. I guess you are referring not to the ones who spoke today in this panel, but to Correct. other presenters. To everyone who is a conference presenter who has been invited into the Zoom um, and who can speak and who can engage in uh, discussion. So that would be people like Mike McCarthy, uh, Hillary Wainwright. Um, if you all look at the gallery view, you'll see who else is in Zoom at this point. So no pressure, but if you'd like to speak, I'll wait another minute. And uh, certainly if you want to talk later, try to get my attention in the chat box or raise your hand. Um, and I'll call on you. Um, I'll prioritize you. Let's go ahead with the questions in the chat box. Um, depending on how many questions there are, and right now it seems manageable, given that we have close to 53 minutes to actually have Q and A one after another. But if it starts becoming too much, then I might collect a few questions and uh, turn them over to the uh, uh, presenters. So let's start with the first one, which I think is for Danielle. Um, and the question is, can you please elaborate uh, on the chances and limitations of neo-Keynesianism as part of a transitional program to democratic socialism? And the example given is maybe the Green New Deal. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the question. Actually, this is something that Brian would be happy to elaborate because we had been exchanging some ideas for the chapter for our book, and he has prepared quite many interesting notes uh, about it. And let me clarify that we are not against social democratic reform or a return to Keynesianism per se. We would say that those kind of reform are actually much better than anything we see today in the heavily neoliberalized economics that we see implemented in many parts of the world. So it's not a question of principle, it's a question of how far can we go and are those kind of reform viable today? And our first quick response is that even if we want social democracy, and that's not what we want, we want something beyond social democracy, more radical anti-capitalist kind of uh, reform, we don't think social democracy is viable today. Maybe it is still possible to maintain or even to some extent expand the welfare state in Europe and in other places where it still exists. But that's not an option for the vast majority of the countries of the South. That's why in my presentation, I refer to the cover of one of the book by Hajun Chan, a Korean economist, who has provided plenty of empirical evidence of why, about why that kind of industrialist protectionist politics that made possible, for instance, the rise of the Asian tigers are not there today for most countries of the uh, South. So we also need to remember that when social democracy uh, came as an alternative, it wasn't a gift, it wasn't a present of the ruling classes. It was the result of struggles. And I'm very happy that Gar referred to the power of the union because this is something that we need to discuss today. The unions that fought for social democracy in many parts of the world now are facing much more urgent problems. They cannot even afford to include in their platform some of the demands that could be seen as social democratic kind of reform. And around the world, Unfortunately, unions are much weaker. This is not only a problem of the United States. Social democracy also emerged in the context of the Cold War, 
Today, the Soviet bloc is gone. And we don't see China, for instance, offering a different kind of economic paradigm. China is a capitalist country. So that's a problem. But we also see subjective problems. And this is something that we did research when we produced the previous book with the Heaven Center about the new Latin American left. In my case, for instance, I did my PhD and my chapter for the book focus on the proposal of the left for municipal urban radical politics. And that was very interesting because we saw that the PT managed to dream truly participatory, innovative, even anti-capitalist kind of platform. When participatory budgeting emerged in Porto Alegre, for instance, it was an extremely radical proposal. But then the same kind of proposal were assimilated by the system. And now we see, for instance, the World Bank exporting a pasteurized form of particip participatory budgeting all over the world. We see mainstream NGOs promoting participatory budgeting. We see right-wing government talking about participatory budgeting. But we also saw in the interviews that we did in Brazil, for instance, that when the PT came into power, much of that a uh, radical platform that the party had developed, it became something else. So we also have to consider the subjective dimension. We did a lot of interviews and many people in the PT who were in national government, they really believed that there was a limit to where they could go. And I'm not saying that those limits are not there, and I'm sure we are going to hear from Costa Lapapitsas, we're going to hear from our Latin American comrades about the problems of the left uh, in government. So we do have to consider the objective conditions, but we also need to consider the subjective uh, limitation. And the reference to the Green uh, New Deal is quite interesting because Obviously, we are not against the Green uh, New Deal, but some of us feel that, first of all, it's a very in order proposal. If we want to talk about a global New Deal, we need to include a lot of demands that are not present today in the platform defended by many European and US based uh, activists. We also see that it's very much an empty signifier because we have a really good uh, slogan, but not much uh, content in terms of uh, concrete policy, and we feel that it has to be uh, radicalized. And this time is to the kind of question that uh, Joel was uh, referring to when he talked about uh, energy. Uh, yeah, it's not a problem of technology. The technology for the energy transition and a radical response to climate change has been there for quite many years already. It's a problem of economics and it's a problem of uh, politics. Many of our friends and comrades who are talking about the Green New Deal, for them, the energy transition is just having more energy cooperatives. And we all love energy cooperatives. I buy energy uh, myself from an energy cooperative in the Netherlands, but they cannot be a solution to the uh, energy crisis or the uh, climate emergency, because in order to address the climate crisis, we need huge public intervention. So that, once again, ties us to the question of the state, but that's an issue that will be the focus of another presentation in this conference. So I don't want to take a lot of time uh, for my- Thank you, Daniel. Well, well, uh, well, hold on, Deepa. At some point we got, I, I don't want to reserve uh, or exclude any consideration of national politics from, from this discussion because we're talking about it elsewhere. I, I think, and, and Gar can correct me if, if, uh, this, if he disagrees or can disagree if he wants to, but I think, um, I think the left should certainly uh, be about, in part, reclaiming the nation state. I just don't think the nation state is going to be the guarantor of the sort of politics we want. And to get the politics we want, you need to have some more concrete and productive stuff uh, outside of the ambit of, of, of national power. What I think the left should be about is uh, a sort of uh, progress where, where you have um, 
uh, where, let's take the instance of where you have some sort of uh, division of responsibility uh, between the nation state and subnational jurisdictions of various sorts. I think you want to have a progressive federalism in which you, you have some strong national floor assured to all citizens within your country, but then you provide uh, support at the national level for anyone who wants to go above that floor in the interest of, of, of flourishing. Uh, uh, and that would mean in the US case, removing a bunch of regulatory barriers and in virtually all cases, providing some level of finance to support those experiments. But you certainly need a nation state. You certainly want to take advantage of, uh, um, you know, the insight, which uh, apparently is new, uh, that you can, you know, borrow pretty much indefinitely on your own currency. The problem in the South, I think, are, are countries that are constrained in that borrowing uh, capacity. Um, because they, they don't basically control their own currencies. So uh, perhaps I'll bring Gar in since he hasn't spoken as yet. Gar, it sounded like you wanted to respond to Joel, but can I also read a question for you so you can attend to both? Um, so the question, this is also from Eric Meyer who asked the first question, what are your thoughts on the relation of your case for decentralization and the big tech monopolies and the potentialities they have um, as a platform for socialism. They are already international in our internally planned economies. Maybe these large platforms can be a starting point for new forms of more abstract organization for a labor base. So that's your question, but if you want to respond, please do. Um, many, many serious uh, questions. Um, I just want to remember, remind folks that uh, during the, the Great Recession, we did in fact nationalize General Motors, the big banks, some of the finance companies, uh, we actually did that recently. There was no programmatics to move it in a different direction, either towards public ownership at the national level or in a larger vision, the decentralization to regional ownership, which in the continental scale of the US, 3000 miles across um, with, with, with California, about the sixth or seventh largest economy in the world, regional issues become very important in a, in a large scale system. So I would not eliminate the possibility and indeed the likelihood of crisis moments as well. So that rebuilding from the bottom up, but also understanding the probability of crisis moments and being prepared for them for larger scale issues, I think is, is absolutely critical. But I think that the, the important thing from the many, many important things, obviously in this, in this very useful discussion, but what, what is the foundational basis of power? Question es que el poder institucional eh, cómo se relacionan a los, eh, a los sindicatos como base de las luchas populares. Si no tenemos una nueva base para las nuevas políticas, eh, tendríamos problemas. Tenemos que... As in Preston and England and, and here in Cleveland and many other cities, that there has to be a new structural explicit discussion of what are the institutional foundations of a longer politics as there once was with the building of the labor union base of social democratic politics. So I often say to, you know, in com other conferences, if you want to play this game to build institutions as a power base, as well as policy in the abstract, that requires laying two or three decades of your life on the table as you are talking about transforming these very powerful systems. We see many, many opportunities. And uh, Joel, for instance, has been way ahead of the game on some of this long ago. Many opportunities at the local level in the United States, at the state level of building from the bottom up with a perspective over time. Uh, Eric, uh, our good friend, the late Eric right, Olin Wright, had this same view of how do you rebuild from the bottom up institutionally as a basis also for new politics. So I am not a utopian optimist, but I'm also a historian. And I think that there are many, many possibilities for a long haul reconstruction from the bottom up. So let me leave it at that. Okay, I wanna bring Hillary Wainwright in. Um, she's one of our conference presenters. Go ahead, Hillary. Yeah, sorry, just turning off my heater. Um, so um, I, I really want to sort of link what Gar said to what Joel said, um, partly in answer to questions that 
that Danielle posed. Um, really trying to um, pin down a bit more the question of agency, the sort of agency of the, the kind of um, productive democracy um, that, that we're talking about. And that's really this term productive democracy I've learned from Joel a long time ago, well, I don't know, that not, maybe not that long time ago, but and in, in your talk, Joel, you rather buried it. I mean, it was sort of, you taught, you referred to productive democracy, but you didn't sort of elaborate it. And yet I think that maybe it is a key concept to what the different components of an alliance or local alliances that can be the foundations of a, a different kind of left. <clears throat> I mean, I'm thinking, and here you see, I, I although I agree in, uh, in in the US, the unions are pretty smashed, but in, in the UK, it's kind of uneven. I mean, they've been massively weakened, you know, by Thatcher, but yet there are elements still there. And so in any locality, uh, a kind of alliance for productive democracy or community wealth building. Yeah. Um, in a way, productive democracies, I think, are slightly more general concept that can include community wealth building as one example. Um, but I think the unions transformed uh, are one component. And I think what we're seeing as a result, or oh, it's a question, an empirical question that maybe you, you can answer. I mean, how far is the um, experience of the pandemic where, where social need, where health, has been the imperative as distinct from the, the free market or any kind of market. Um, I mean, obviously in Britain, you know, they're trying to, to try and reimpose the market desperately, but there's been a sort of experience of, of having to live, having to live materially in a context where a social need, health is imperative. So one's, ha one's seen sort of adaptions in small examples that I don't want to over exaggerate but maybe provide a key to the future so in in Britain there have been examples um, of airplane workers transforming their factories to produce ventilators or um, teachers unions taking on um, the question of health not just in terms of defending their own members but defending the community, parents, grandparents. Hilary, you know. if you can wrap up quickly. So yes, so my point is really, could we bring back this concept of productive democracy uh, and, and use it strategically? And so it's a kind of question to Joel, but maybe also to Gar and Danielle. Joel, if uh, you want to respond, and then I'll, I'll, I'll read three questions and have all of you come back in. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so I didn't talk about productive democracy because I was invited not to talk about it, but just to give some brief comments on Gar and and uh, and, and Daniel. Uh, but productive democracy essentially is it changes when you think about key aspects of um, decisions that need to be made by any society. Uh, it would it would focus a little bit more on effective supply than effective demand as the only guarantee. It would move the, the redistributional aspects of the state earlier in the life course. It would uh, have a progressive federalism with floors on local innovation, but no ceilings. It, it would also have a, you know, a basic income guarantee, but not put all of the weight on that. And it also has a view on, on what international affairs should be. Uh, uh, you can you can find writings on it. I mean, you, you can Google productive democracy if you want. And I'm delighted that, uh, that it persuaded my very esteemed uh, colleague from England, who I haven't seen in years, Hillary. It's very nice to see him. On your first question, though, who is the agent? Uh, I I don't think it's the working class. I think it's a citizen who wants to die only once, who wants to fully grab the possibilities of life and values life and wants to have, um, is willing to uh, try to work with other people in respectful ways. And I think that's most of humanity right there. Um, that, that's my agent. Uh, it's the, it's the, the citizen is the agent. But does a citizen need to get organized? Yes, of course. And 
Um, but I, I don't see that happening through merely at the workplace or in the household. Uh, I see it happening on a much more sort of community basis or broad uh, basis, you know, quasi unions that you could all belong to, uh, and then through national uh, parties with, with local affiliates uh, all over the place. Uh, the political organ. And uh, just, I'm talking too much already, but Hillary, I'm a big fan, uh, and I hope all of you guys are big fans of foundational economy folks uh, in, in, um, in, in England and, and in the continent, and uh, the strong towns folks uh, here in the US, and other people who are trying to work with a conception of doing local planning where those very basic public goods, or as people say often, provisionings, you know, the essential services are provided. You get the finance, this is close to Gar's heart and mine, you have to have the finance in place for that. But, but the way to provide that more efficiently in a way more attentive to, to human needs, I, I think we know a lot more about. I mean, we can, we can house people, we know how to feed them, we know how to uh, have them uh, have uh, non-climate destructive mobility. Uh, we know how to uh, connect them to each other much better than we used to. Um, we should learn, relearn some of that old stuff and that gets down into the, uh, into, uh, stuff we don't want to get into details around actually land use and, and zoning codes and other stuff. But there's a lot of stuff there that the left has been absent from for a very long time, the national lefts or our national lefts or our international lefts, where I think we have to have to uh, uh, get back in. Um, cities are, that's where people live. Joel, if you can. Yeah, I'll stop. I'll stop. Okay. Right, I'm sorry. sorry. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Okay, so uh, Mabel wants to get in at some point, and so please let me know when you'd like to speak, um, Mabel Ray, um, but I'll go back to questions now. I'm sorry, no, I am just thinking about how to uh, articulate sure. the, um, the global level, the national level and the local level. It's, it's, a, it's an old problem for us. Uh, I think that sometimes it's quite uh, uh, um, a temptation to to have a refuge uh, in the local uh, system, but it's not. Uh, I don't think that it's a good idea. But but I think that we we have to think uh, the totality and act in the local levels, but we have to make the effort to construct an, uh, a very broad uh, uh, form of comprehension that, uh, of the actual moment of the capitalism. And uh, I don't know <laughs> my, the, 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 the panelist if has uh, um, some, uh, some insights. Daniel, quickly, and then I'll go to a bunch of questions so we can move on and make sure that everyone who has a question is heard. Yes, uh, it's partly a response to uh, Joel. I think we need to be careful not to generalize too much. And this is mainly self-criticism because when Gar first intervened, he clarified that he was going to be talking about the US. I tried to give a more global perspective. But both uh, God and myself talk about the weakening power of unions and other traditional social movements. But this is not a situation that happens everywhere, as Hillary already clarified for the case of the UK. And we also see some countries in the South where unions are not necessarily weaker. And I could be talking, for instance, about my home country, uh, Uruguay, where we still have a quite vibrant uh, workers uh, movement. And also in response to uh, Joel, I was not idealizing the national state or the national dimension. And this refers also to uh, Mabel's uh, question. I think we need to articulate different levels of intervention. But we need to recognize the importance of public ownership, because mainly of the, especially the environmentalist discourse, 
is too much focus on micro community level experiences, which are good as prefigurative experiences, and we all love them, but they are not enough, especially in the context of the climate emergency. We need huge public intervention. If we don't get that, we are doomed. We are not gonna solve the climate emergency. And I guess Sean Sweeney is gonna be talking about this on a Friday. And finally, I think we need to discuss the distinction between social democratic reform and anti-capitalist reform more as a continuum as, than as a black and white uh, uh, distinction. In our paper, we go back to Andre Gors when he talks about non-reformist reform, which are reform that try to radical restructure the system, but beginning as social democratic reform. And this is something that we saw in some countries of the South. And maybe Constanza is gonna talk about the experience of Uruguay. There, for instance, the national health system was consolidated, was actually created in some sense by the left in government. And an economist, a senator of the Frente Amplio, who really thought about this, he used to refer to the national health system as a proto-socialist uh, kind of reform. And I think he was right. I don't want to take time to explain this because maybe it will come back in another presentation, but I want to stress the fact that we shouldn't talk as black and white distinction rather than uh, instead uh, talking about continue. Thank you, Daniel. So I'm gonna call, I'm gonna read out about three questions now since we've got a now a long uh, list of questions and you know each of you can come back to them. Uh, but one of our conference presenters, Gabrielle uh, Hetland also has a question. So I'll read these three, I'll have uh, Gabrielle speak and then um, allow the three of you to respond. So this is a question for Gar from Juliana. The idea of a local community building politics does seem the pragmatic way forward, but this approach raises the question of what we do with ideology. After all, the success of unions was arguably based not just on mutual interest, but a commitment to an ideological framework that put workers as the drivers of social change. In the model that you are proposing, do we abandon an attempt at broader ideological unifying politics, socialist, anarchist politics, etc.? Relatedly, how do you guarantee that a politics of particularism, that is my community is the most important community, does not overtake a sense of the collective? So that's one question to Gar. We have another one from Mark. Is there a growing awareness of issues like tax avoidance by Amazon, Apple, Google, et cetera, and their role in growing inequality? And does work around climate justice start to challenge the extractivist colonial trade and trail deals? Give us the potential that as people demand action on climate change, they will support ideas from the left as it is uh, capitalism that has brought, from the left that capitalism has brought us to the brink of environmental breakdown. And a question from Travis, this seems to be for everyone. How is the danger presented by the new economics forum, um, Davos, to be combated? The great reset, the internet of things are being forced through at a great pace as in 5G networks, the worldwide poverty that will be exacerbated through COVID-19 will be fruitful grounds for privately controlled digital learning, health, prisons, et cetera. So three questions. I wanna throw it first to Gar because there is a direct question to you and then call in the other two. Oh, I'm sorry, um, um, Gabrielle uh, Hetland, your comment or question, please. And then we'll, we'll let Gar respond. Sure, thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll do it directly to Joel. I was happy to hear you uh, be slightly more optimistic than most folks on climate change. Um, and I wanted to just probe a little bit. Is your optimism based on your view that we can get things done in the next 10 years to you know, avoid going to sort of tipping points that lead to out of control warming? Um, or would it be based on a sort of geoengineering optimism, uh, which I see more and more leftists being at least willing to countenance and to think about that you think that there is the technology, as you were speaking of earlier, to fix things and actually get atmosphere out of, you know, uh, sort of redo the atmosphere in ways, although that 
I mean, the latest that I saw a couple of years ago from Naomi Klein was that that was pretty worrisome and also very inegalitarian. So if you can, you know, clarify any more of your reasons for optimism, that would be great. Thanks. So we'll have Gar and then Joel, you can come in later. Thank you. Yeah, sure. We've talked the, enough. Um, the, there's so many important aspects of the questions that have been posed. So let me just try to center in on a few that, that seem important. Um, what strikes me uh, in the social democratic models in, the, in general, but in the United States, the basis of a so-called progressive liberal or social democratic policy has always been labor unions as a central figure. In, in the Scandinavian countries, 85% of the labor force was organized and the welfare state depended upon that. The striking thing is happening in the United States and may be happening and is happening progressively, but not to that extent, is that labor unions in the private sector in the United States are 6%, six percent, six and declining, 10% if you include all the public employees and declining. So that the foundational institutional element of a progressive politics in the United States, and I think in other countries, if you look closely, but not as not at the same pace, is disintegrating. So is there a foundational institutional base of a new politics that can be built up over time, step by step, which both produces a progressive, some form of communitarian socialist vision, but is inclusive of all the people lo locally, as a central issue, not only of the design of the next system, but of the power base to enforce and develop it. And that model of trying to put those two pieces together as the element that was central to all social democratic politics, labor organizing, de declines. A second piece of that was part of the labor union organizing, and I speak from great experience here with some parts of the industrial labor unions, were totally supportive of imperial economic structures and exploitation internationally. Not all of them, but a good part of them because their markets depended on that. So even as a great admirer of the, of the labor movement and participant and friend of and ally, we need to be honest about how that power structure forced them into positions that had to do with the climate and, and destruction of the climate, also international aspects. So the question becomes, how do you build from the bottom up the basis over time, starting with an inclusive unit, everybody, the old people, the sick people, the young people, inclusive, the workers, all together, in some unit and the only unit is somehow inclusive of community as an institutional force rather than just a polity. So we've been experimenting with that. It's obviously, there's a whole history of that development. We've seen quite response, good responses in many areas, exploratory responses in other areas. But the central question becomes in the United States particularly, but I, I would venture to say in many other countries as time goes on, as the labor union institutional foundations of social democracy decays. What is the new institutional base of the vision that I think most people in this discussion share? How do we build that up? And then at the national regional level for larger industries. Joel or Danielle, do you want to come in on any of these questions? Um, <clears throat> Danielle, you want to you want to go first? I, I feel I talked to. All right, so. Uh, someone asked about the values uh, on the productive democracy stuff, and the, and the values are, are pretty straightforward, and I think almost universally uh, approved of uh, freedom, opportunity, responsibility for all, and, and that will begin to give you a basis for arguing against the rancid sort of uh, not in my backyard particularism that you can get if you ever have uh, devolved power uh, on the on the optimism on the energy stuff, uh, Gabrielle, uh, in my head, we currently produce on a continuous basis about 18, let's round up to 20 terawatts of power to power the world. With a population of around 8 billion people, that means about 2.5 kilowatts on a continuous basis per person. Uh, Europe operates at around five, we, we operate at around eight or nine, it's a ridiculously wasteful system in the US. But, but what I think, uh, an easy way to think about it is you need 50 terawatts, 30 to 50 terawatts to have what are currently 
quote, advanced or, or good living standards of the sort that you have in, in Western Europe, except taking averages again and, and you know, recognizing all sorts of inequalities. I don't see that happening anytime within my lifetime simply through solar and wind, although I'd love if it did. So I'm fully open to nukes, which a lot of you might be not, might not be. I think you need baseload power guaranteed. Uh, but when I look at the next generation of breeder reactors, and as well as all the stuff we always talk about and properly celebrate the tremendous increases in efficiency uh, in the batteries, in, in the solar generation, the, the possibilities of uh, distributed solar, concentrating solar, uh, and the possibilities in wind. I just, I think it's a technical problem, which indeed does require a bunch of political will. Um, but but uh, uh, that's the base, my basis of optimism. And then on the biodiversity stuff, I simply think if you get people into cities, you can rewild the rest of the place. And if you, you know, get some international agreement on the seas, you can let the oceans come back. You know, we've obviously done a huge amount of damage uh, to our biosphere, but I don't think we're, we're at a tipping point anytime real soon. Thanks, uh, Joel. Um, so one of our conference presenters, Lucio Mexico, would also like to make a comment. I'll call him and then go to the next batch of questions. Lucio, please go ahead. Uh, si puedo hablar en español? Sí. I will speak in Spanish. The three panelists of today spoke about the importance of creating a popular power, of making progress in this popular power in order to think about alternative uh, ways of building that power. I think there is a problem of consciousness and it's based on the fact that social life today is highly individualized. It's isolated or it ignores the necessities and the problems of society as a whole. Each individual sees what is immediate in their life and does not value or does not give the adequate dimensions to the problems uh, so that society or that the majority of the population is suffering. This means that we need a change in collective consciousness. In this world of fake news that is dominated by uh, media, uh, hegemonic media, oligarchic media, it's extremely difficult. But I think it's, it's important, uh, fundamental, in order to construct this popular power. If we don't address this, um, a different, a change in how to identify with the problems of the majority of the population, we will not, or it will be very difficult to construct a new form of politics and power. So I think these points are central to our discussion. That's, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you so much. Uh, for those who need a translation, it is really easy to do. All you go is to the interpretation icon and choose English translation. And then, you know, the translation was really excellent. So if this happens again, you'll know what to do. Um, do any of the panelists want to say anything? I, I think I should move on unless you have some burning comments. I'd like to bring some more questions in if that's okay. Okay, great. So here's a question from Juan. Here in Latin America, is an alternative to build and reorganize the process of production from the bottom and the social relations uh, within called popular and social economy. My question is if that theoretical and practical perspective is known in other parts of the world. And if it is, how can it be one of the inputs to build economic and social power uh, within an international, with an internationalist net action? How can we articulate that net from south to north. So that's, uh, I won't be able to call people who've already asked a question before in order to keep this democratic and bring in as many voices as possible. So I'm gonna skip on to the next question. 
glad that the role of big tech was mentioned by Danielle, but not enough, I think, by the whole panel to characterize their enormous influence in the 21st century uh, over monopoly, 21st century monopoly capitalism, um, digital capitalism, platform capitalism, surveillance capitalism. What are the panelists' thoughts and learnings about the role and place of digital society, technological changes, social media discourse in democratic left analysis, and the future socialist project? Uh, one more question. Is the binary religious versus secular sufficient? Can it push people with religious com commitments towards the right? What is the place for progressive religious movements? How can alliances be built with these groups as part of what Gramsci might have called war of position? So three questions and um, throw it to whoever wants to kick off the discussion. Perhaps Danielle, since you didn't speak last, please go ahead. Yes, uh, the question about the solidarity economy is very important and is very relevant for the conversation that we're gonna have this week. And the short answer is that yes, in other parts of the Europe, there are similar discussions to the one we have in Latin America. In the program of the conference, we will have a Camila Pinheiro Harnecker from Cuba, who has done a lot of research about the solidarity economy in different parts of Latin America, in particular in Venezuela. So I'm not gonna talk about Latin America, but I just wanted to say that there is a very interesting conversation going on in Europe that has started already long time ago and also in the US. We call it differently, but we are referring to similar ideas. For instance, in Europe, much of the conversation is around the commons, and much of the new theorization is about the notion of the commons. This is not a, a monolithic kind of conceptualization, because there are a lot of discussion within the camp of the commoners. Some people tend to identify the commons as a different kind of economic and political space against or beyond the market and the state, while other, which I consider more sophisticated analysis, such as that of uh, Michel Bowens, uh, for instance, from Belgium, refer to the commons also in parallel to changing the state, because he does recognize the importance of uh, public ownership, while many of his friends and colleagues in the, in the uh, camp of the commoners tend to idealize uh, platform cooperatives and other kind of organization. He does refer to the need to think the commons. And then there are also some very interesting debate, especially in the Balkans, about how to commonize the states. For instance, the Institute for Political Ecology in Croatia has done a lot of interesting thinking about that. But I also wanted to relate to the question of uh, big tech and also to the question by Gabriel, because I didn't have the opportunity to respond to that. And I do agree with uh, Gabriel uh, Headland that technophysics are not the solution to the uh, climate uh, crisis. And actually, I feel we shouldn't have a discussion purely about technology. For instance, in the field of energy, which is the one I've been working for quite many years, the technology for wind and solar generation doesn't, hasn't really changed much in 20, 30 years. So the problem is not about technology. The technology was there already a long time ago. The problem is who owns this technology, who implements this uh, technology. Much of the renewable energy transition now is controlled by a few transnational corporations, and we need to challenge uh, that. And we also need to talk about the issue of scale, because it's not the same to have a wind farm or a solar uh, uh, generation run by an energy cooperative at the local scale or by a municipal company such as Barcelona wants to do, than to have a huge area full of uh, wind generation uh, as has happened for instance in Oaxaca, because that implies displacing local people, environmental damage and so on. So we cannot say that 
technology is clean or not clean. It's much more complex than that and has to do with who owns the technology and who implements uh, that. But again, I feel we need to discuss uh, public ownership, but I'm sure this is something that will come up in many uh, conversation in this conference during the week. Okay, do any of the other? Joel, if you're speaking next, might you also address the tech question posed to you at the end? Uh, it's up to you, but I suspect we won't get to it. But if you're talking about tech, that would be great. Thanks. Yeah, I just want to say, of course, I agree with Daniel. Of course, it's not just tech. And it's all about its use and and the, and, and the ownership and who, who gets the benefit of, of the actual return on the tech. Absolutely. I just want to emphasize. And Daniel, I also agree with you, you need a ton of money intelligently used to do this, which means you, you know, you're going to need some national entities or very, very big regional entities. The only possible area of disagreement is, as we think about these big changes, let's not be captured by, you know, one of Unger's false necessities that somehow these systems are are unique to each themselves and they're self-enclosed, et cetera. A lot of the structural change we both aim at, the really radical change, often starts with uh, things that are piecemeal, fragmentary, gradual, experimental. So we shouldn't identify radical change with wholesale change or gradual change with inconsequential change. I wanna get beyond that reform versus revolution. Make your choice, put your money down. I think that is not good for the left. Okay, thank you. Gar, I have a, the next question is for you. So if you want me to read that question and then come in on any comments to the previous ones, that would be fantastic. So what I'm going to do is the following. We have eight minutes left before the conclusion of this uh, panel. I'm going to read out all the questions. I'm going to have Gar speak to as many as he possibly can and hand it to Danielle and finally to Joel and uh, we'll wrap it up and hopefully we can keep that all to uh, a few minutes. <laughs> all right, so for Gar, you make an excellent point. Uh, dem democracy will not be served if politics were devolved closer to the people. However, the fall issue of ja Jacobin ran an article titled Ending Federalism as We Know It. This article convincingly argued the opposite, that states' rights movements had disenfranchised the expression of voters' will at the federal level using such examples as right to work laws and the efforts and successes of the American Legislative uh, Exchange Council. Both you and the author, Philip Rocco, make good arguments which seem antithetical. Can you please address this? Um, from Pamela, given the conditions of subordination between the global North and South, how is it po possible to articulate a global struggle front? What are the common references and what are the biggest differences to consider? From Eleanor, can speakers elaborate on the role of the climate crisis in their analysis? Bill McKibben points out that in the case of climate change, winning slowly is the same as losing. While we have technologies to meet this crisis, we lack the political will to supplant the fossil fuel industry. Uh, my goodness, I've taken up two minutes just asking those questions. So I guess I'll just end it there. And there is a question at the end uh, for you, Joel, if you can read that on your own about uh, your tech optimism, apparently, and respond to that, that will be great. And maybe just one last question from someone who hasn't spoken. Um, Jerry Harris, what do you think of the Black church as an important institutional base for change, not just for the Black community, but also in a broader sense, such as the current election in Georgia or Reverend Barber's Moral Monday? So that's more or less all of the questions. And if each person can take maybe three minutes, uh, we'll just be slightly over time, but giving more time to Gar since you know you haven't had that much of an opportunity to speak. So, oh goodness, where do we start? Um, the the issue of federalism at the at the outset is very very particularly difficult in the United States, but given the scale, three thousand miles across diagonally, basically, I think inevitably we're going to have to have. Uh, decentralization to different communities, uh, regional communities. Now, within regional communities, 
there is very little possibility in nations or regional communities of constructing a positive and progressive national politics and, and a democratic socialist or communitarian politics without rebuilding from the bottom up. There is no, without that power base, nothing above happens very well. So the question is, are the units at the bottom inclusive of all the people so that you build a culture as well as a political power base, piece by piece, community by community, regionally in the large scale, nationally in smaller scale countries, so that what you've got is not just policy, but the institutional underpinnings beyond the labor organizations, which are now declining in many countries, radically declining in the United States, that empower that politics with a new power as well as culture that is inclusive of everyone. So that's, that's the fundamental argument for a different restructuring from the bottom up. I would say that beyond that, climate is really critical and we're getting a moral aspect of that as we've had many, many times before and civil rights finally broke through, took feminism a hundred years to break through. That issue be becomes a moral dimension of politics that is quite separate from the institutional basis. And I think the third dimension, and that's what we're talking about here, and it becomes critical at this point in time. So I, would, I end with this point. We are now talking about systemic design. If you don't like state socialism and you don't like social democracy based on capitalism, the labor unions tied in and almost often partly co-opted by it, what is the model? How do you build a model beyond these two traditional models? Uh, Gortz was interested in this question. We actually brought Gortz to the United States very early on to talk about the different model. And uh, one premise I would suggest, unless at the bottom, it is inclusive of all the people. That means the old people, the young people, the different races who have a different aspect, those who cannot work. Unless the vision is inclusive, then we cannot get to an inclusive ecological or democratic vision. And that's different from the social democratic model, which included labor union organizing, which I'm a great fan and supporter of in the, 19, in the 20th century, but it was a sectoral one. And many labor unions still in the United States, Great Britain and many other countries are dependent on the world market and dependent on displacing implicitly other people around the world. So there's a whole question about the role of labor unions in the progressive part of the labor union movement. Ours are so destroyed down to 10% of the labor force. And of that, three quarters of that is teachers and local people who are not involved in the, in the economic system other than in the private economic system. So it's a whole different question of what labor means in the, in the coming era, very different in different countries. But I think the possibility of an inclusive vision that somehow begins with a communitarian vision of some kind, and I would say a socialist kind, is a foundation of the larger transformation that needs to build both power and a vision for the larger system. Uh, I'll stop there or I'll go on for two hours. So I better stop there. Thank you, Gar. Um, either of you, Danielle or Joel. Yes, I'm, I'm very happy about the question of, about the climate emergency. And I fully agree with the second part that was the answer to the question, especially when you say that if we go slow, we are not advancing, we are actually going uh, backward. But the problem is that this is not only a problem of the right. The left, when has been in government, has been as environmentally destructive, in most cases, as the right. I guess our comrades from Latin America are going to talk uh, about that, what happened in Venezuela, in Ecuador, in Bolivia, in my country, Uruguay, where the tendency to extractivism and environmental exfoliation didn't stop. It was actually intensified in many cases when the left came into government. I think much of the global left has failed to recognize that social conflicts are increasingly being fought over capitalism, expropriation, and exfoliation of the wider social and natural environment. Uh, some researchers have been uh, arguing for a quite a long time that at the root of the problem of the current crisis, the COVID crisis, the, the pandemic, but the overall convergence of crisis is the extreme appropriation of the earth itself and the consequent transformation in social relation. So I guess there's plenty to discuss, especially in panel nine. 
uh, on Friday about eco-socialist kind of uh, alternatives within the left. So I stop here. And I want to thank uh, Gar and Joel for the very interesting comment. When we decided with some current from different countries to restart the new, the new politics project, we took as the model, as the reference, the, uh, the next system project. And I think that project is much more needed in the US uh, today more than ever. And it shouldn't be just a US-based project. It should be a sort of global project. Deep, I think we're out of time now, aren't we? Yeah, but you can have a few minutes. It's all right, because the next session does not start till quarter till, so maybe two minutes. Okay, two minutes. So someone asked about my, my astounding techno optimist. I, I'm not an optimist or a pessimist, as I said at the beginning. I, I simply, I think that uh, there are a number of new toys uh, that are available to us, uh, us being the, the democratic left, the democratic left uh, being the people, that community of people who believes everyone on earth should have um, um, uh, uh, broadly equal access to the, the, what they need to develop themselves and, and to flourish um, and, and uh, uh, equal power uh, in their self-governing. Um, I think we have a lot of tools and favorable conditions for that, uh, that human project. You want to call it the socialist project, uh, fine with me, but it's a project which is going to require that mankind advance beyond uh, its fa current phase of, uh, <laughs> I don't know, predatory human development, as, uh, as Einstein jokingly observed. That, that's what socialism is about. It's about mankind's attempt to go beyond the predatory phase of human development. I think COVID has shown us all that we are going to... Uh, um, uh, love each other or die. I mean, that, that's an obligation we have. And, and of course, nature is an important part of, of our life and um, we have to be at peace with nature. I, I'm not in any way minimizing the climate crisis. I don't think as a practical matter of politics, catastrophism does a lot for you in building a politics that a large number of people are going to vote for. Um, and so I'm against catastrophism without exaggerating the resilient capacity of nature, which is much more consistent, I think, or abundant than most of the left recognizes. And I'm, um, I'm for building broad uh, political programs, a broad appeal, manifest general benefit, getting functioning majorities and having them disciplined and encourage life from the ground up. Thank you. Thank you so much to all our panelists for such a stimulating conversation, um, to other conference speakers for their comments and questions, and of course, to the attendees of this conference. This is a great start uh, to this conference and uh, what promises to be a great week of discussions.